Well, good morning. Thank you for coming. We at FBC are delighted to have another Moriel Teaching Weekend. And as in the past, our featured speaker for these Moriel Teaching week Weekends has been none other than Jacob Prash. He's a friend of FBC. He's ministered here multiple times. Uh, we've benefited from his insight into the Word. Uh, we are grateful and thankful to the Lord that he is able to be uh, here today. Um, would you join me in, in prayer as, uh, as we lift Jacob up? Father, thank you for your servant Jacob. We pray for the ministry of your Holy Spirit uh, in his life this morning. Uh, we pray that he could uh, preach and teach with, with power and authority from, from your word. Uh, Father, thank you for this uh, opportunity and for the blessing that it represents. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Join me in an enthusiastic FBC welcome for Jacob Prash. If you knew the half of it, you'd be throwing tomatoes, if not hand grenades. I can go short distances without crutches today. The pub was closed. Good morning. Wonderful to be with you all here in Ohio, in the American Midwest. Uh, we're going to have two teachings this morning and to today. One will be from Isaiah chapter 11. What time is it? The shifting patterns of prophecy. How do you know what time frame a prophet is talking about when he's predicting something? Is he talking about the first coming of Christ, the second coming of Christ, his own time? How do we approach the subject of knowing what era or what time frame a prophet is prophesying for, especially predictively, and we'll use Isaiah 11 as a base text to address that. It's an important thing. Most Christians have never even they're aware of the problem, but they've never ever tried to approach solving the problem, um, leaving it to theologians who disagree with each other. But Jesus told us one is our teacher who's in heaven. So we're going to see what the Lord will tell us today, hopefully uh, through this most unworthy of vessels. But the first teaching we're going to do today is leaven and prophecy, leaven and prophecy. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you and praise you for your goodness, for your kindness. We thank you, Lord God, for the blood of your Son that cleanses from all sin, for the cross and the power of his resurrection to give us eternal life, his atonement on our behalf, but also the freedom and eternal life he gives us so graciously because of your goodness to us through him. Fill us with your spirit this day, Lord God, and speak to us, not from a man, but by your unmerited grace through a man. We need to hear from you, not from Jacob. Speak to us from your word, Lord, by the power of your spirit. Let these things, Lord God, not increase our knowledge with the aim of increasing our knowledge, but increasing our knowledge with the aim of making us more conformed to the image and likeness of your son, of serving him, and of reaching others in his name with your goodness. We praise you and thank you. Be with us now, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, the one who saved us. Amen. Leaven and prophecy. Leaven and prophecy. Most believers have the idea or the concept of, of, of unleavened bread, matzah, matzah. Many churches will use matzah, unleavened bread, when they take the Lord's Supper, and it is entirely appropriate they do so. Matzah, of course, if you've seen it, and most of you have, I take it all of you probably have, matzah is striped and it's pierced. And according to John chapter 6, and according to the writings of the rabbis in the Mishnah, matzah, unleavened bread, corresponds in figure to the flesh of the Paschal Lamb. It is striped and it is pierced. By his stripes we are healed, he was pierced by our transgressions. We are one body and it is broken. This is the matzah. It has no leaven. Let's begin by looking at the subject of the matzah and the leaven. We're basically going to concentrate 
on the New Testament today, but first a few passages, please, from the Old Testament. Look with me, please, if you will, to the subject of matzah from Leviticus chapter 2, verse 11. No grain offering which you bring to the Lord shall be made with leaven, for you shall not offer up in smoke any leaven or any honey as an offering by fire to the Lord. We have a teaching on the grain offering where we address this at some length. Look with me, please, to Exodus chapter 12, verse 19. Seven days there shall be no leaven found in your house, for whoever eats what is leaven, that person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he's an alien or a native of the land. God obviously has a problem with leaven. And Numbers chapter 6, verse 3. Numbers 6, 3. He shall abstain from wine and strong drink. He shall drink no vinegar, whether made from wine or strong drink, nor shall he drink any grape juice, nor shall he eat any dried grapes. Now this is talking about the restrictions on the diet of a Nazarene, the diet of a Nazarene. He was to avoid these things. However, when you look at the Hebrew text, it's the term chametz, chametz. The term for leavening in Hebrew, leavening, is the same as fermentation. It's associated in the original language with the process of grape juice turning into an alcoholic drink. It's the same term in the original Hebrew. It's the same term in the original Hebrew. Thus, there could be no leavening in what he drank or what he ate. The Nazarite being a type of Jesus, the Nazarene, an Old Testament shadow. Absolutely no leaven. There was none in the wine, none in the food. Well, we interpret the Old Testament in light of the New Testament revelation of Jesus. What was this issue that God had the problem with? My apologies to those who knew this. Look with me, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We will begin with the Pauline explanation of leaven. Verse 6, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the entire lump of dough? Again, my apologies to those who know this from our previous teaching. Leaven is a figure not only of sin, but the seminal sin, pride. Pride is the sin which always begets other sin. You see greed undergirding it is pride. You see lust, undergirding it is pride. You see unrighteous anger, undergirding it is pride. Pride is the seminal sin. It's the sin that causes others sin. Man's first sin was pride. He wanted to be God. Satan's first sin, Isaiah 14, was pride. He wanted to be God. Pride is the sin that begets other sin. Jesus had no pride. Now, he was God and he had no sin. He had something to be proud of, but he wasn't. <laughs> we have nothing to be proud of except him. We have nothing to be proud of except Jesus. You're intelligent, you receive that. Paul says we have nothing that we haven't received. We can't be proud of being naturally intelligent or naturally physically healthy or naturally physically attractive, clever in business, any of those things we've received. You have nothing you haven't received. Above all, salvation. We received it. None of us have anything to be proud of. We all have a great deal to be ashamed of because of our sin. 
But none of us have anything to be proud of except Jesus. The only thing we have to be proud of is him. That's the only thing. And he had no pride. He had no sin. He came humble. Just think, he, he, he came humble. The only person who could have chosen the circumstances of his birth chose to be born a member of a despised race in a stable and an occupied country of a lower middle class family. <laughs> he made all the wrong decisions in any human sense of the word. Quite a thing. Comes lowly on the colt of an ox. There was no leaven in the matzah because he who knew no sin became sin, he took ours. Hence we see God's problem with leaven. When Jewish people eat the Passover, they have to begin with the bedichat hametz, the search for leaven, the search for leaven. Spring cleaning as a tradition originates from this biblical practice. You remove everything containing leaven out of the house. Your white cookies, bread, cake, anything is removed. And when your children are little, the night before Passover, you play a little game. It's a ritual. And you hide some cookies. And the children have to find it. And if they find it, you give them a present, some money usually like that. And you take the cookies, because it has leaven, outside the house. And you pray a prayer of repentance as a family, and you burn it. You burn it. You pray a prayer of repentance as a family, and you burn it so that you can eat the Passover. Now, understanding this background, let's look. 1 Corinthians 5. Your boasting is not good in verse 6. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened, for Christ our Passover has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean with the immoral people of this world, or with the covetous and the swindlers, or with idolaters, for then you'd have to go out of the world. But I actually wrote you not to associate with any so-called brother, if he's an immoral person, or covetous, or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. Now, in the context of the epistle, not to eat with such a one means not to take the Lord's Supper with them. When we get to chapter 11, we see this. The early Christians met house to house, and they broke bread. They had the Lord's Supper and what were known as the gapes fellowship meals. And what it's saying is don't take the Lord's Supper with somebody who claims to be a Christian who lives this way. The epistle of Jude deals with this. Jude's epistle deals with the subject of backsliders in the church. And it says these people are blemishes on your love feasts. They're blemishes on your love feasts. They defile the Lord's table. When we Take the Lord's Supper with people like this. The Lord's table is defiled. Now, we've explained this many times. The Lord's Supper is the centerpiece of our fellowship and our worship as believers. It's the centerpiece. Worship, fellowship, exposition of the word, all important. But the Lord's Supper is the highlight because it's a memorial of what he did in his death and resurrection, but it's an appetizer of the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's where we came from and where we're going. It's a foretaste of the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's why Jesus told his disciples at the Last Supper, I long to eat the Passover with you, but I'll not do it until I do it again in the kingdom. It is a foretaste of the marriage supper of the Lamb. When we take the Lord's Supper, we're remembering what he did when he took our sin and rose from the dead to give us eternal life, but we're also looking forward to what he's going to do. It's where we came from, and it's where we're going. This is the centerpiece. Unfortunately, Christians, 
have been very good over the centuries at correcting error with error. They have been good at correcting error with another error. The Protestant reformers, for instance, were all from the intelligentsia of the Roman Catholic clergy. They were humanist scholars within the Roman Catholic clergy. They were educated men. They were humanist scholars who learned classical languages and so forth. And when they did that, they realized the idolatry of the mass. They realized the idolatry of transubstantiation. Our Jesus said, if anybody says I've returned physically, don't believe them. I'm coming back the way I went. The Eucharistic Christ of the Mass is not the real Jesus. They believe he returns physically under the appearances of bread and wine, and they literally worship it and pray to it as Christ incarnate appearing physically. Now the reformers being Catholic priests who became believers understood this was idolatry and superstition. So to reject the Mass, to reject what the Church of Rome did, with its idolatry and in fact cannibalism. If they really believe it's blood, they shouldn't, his blood, they shouldn't be drinking it according to Acts 15. It forbids the consumption of blood. Vampire religion is completely outlawed. So in reaction against this idolatry and cannibalism, the reformers played down the Lord's Supper. You have churches and denominations that do it once a year or once a quarter or something like this. <laughs> They're correcting error with error. It's something that's to be done regularly and on a normal basis. Now our subject today is not the Lord's Supper, but one aspect of it is the Bedichat Chametz. We are told in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that if we habitually take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, it can reduce our longevity. People can become physically sick and even die, biologically die, prematurely by doing it. One of the purposes of the Lord's Supper is to keep us in repentance mode. <laughs> when we come together, it keeps us repenting of how many times we dropped our crosses since we took it the previous time. Ah, it keeps us in repentance mode. It's a mechanism to keep us dealing with the old nature. Now, if you're only doing it once a year, <laughs> that's not what the Lord ordained. Observant Jewish families have a mini Passover every Friday night called Kiddush Shabbat. In imitation of this, or in parallel to this, the early believers, the first of whom were Jewish, continued this tradition. They took the Lord's Supper on a regular, certainly a weekly basis, not necessarily on a Saturday. They observed Saturday and Sunday if they were Jewish, we know from history, but they did it on a regular basis basis. The idea of not taking the Lord's Supper regularly is a problem, and one of the problems is it stops us from purging the leaven. Not to associate with any so-called brother. So-called brother. If he's covetous, if he's, or she, as the case may be, immoral, or if they're a swindler. Now, I didn't mean the people of this world. Another way the church corrected error with error. After the time of Constantine, as the church, as, as Christianity was transformed into Christendom, and it became a religious culture more than a personal faith, and the church was no longer the ecclesia, the called out ones, because you had a pseudo-Christianized society, the church got more and more worldly. To escape the worldliness, you had the Desert Fathers who came into contact with Buddhist monks who reached Alexandria, and they began going into the desert, separating themselves from the world. Eventually from this would come cloisterism and convents and monasteries and things of this nature, isolating yourself from the world to maintain a holy standard of living. Again, correcting error with error. Jesus never taught such things. He taught us to be in the world, but not of it. If you're not in the world, associating with unsaved people, how are we going to evangelize them? <laughs> it's a completely unbiblical way to deal with worldliness. Not only that, but when you read Colossians, you see that these religious practices, no matter how meticulous, 
are useless in overcoming the flesh. They have the appearance of religion, that Paul says, but they're useless. Just again, look at the Roman church. They have all of these things, but every diocese and archdiocese of the Roman church in the United States alone has been found legally culpable for protecting pedophile sex criminal clergy at the expense of not protecting children, at the expense of not protecting children. They've spent, just in Los Angeles alone, between the out-of-court settlements and the legal fees was nearly $1 billion to keep Cardinal Mahoney out of prison, virtually. It's just Los Angeles. Uh, well, they have all this stuff of celibacy. We're not going to have this, or we're not going to have that. And nuns, none of this, none of that. Does it do any good to stop the moral reprobate? No. But to be in the world, but not of it. It's only the power of the Holy Spirit that will stop us from sinning, not trying to cut ourselves off from the world. That doesn't work. In fact, it increases it. These natural appetites are stopped, and people become even more perverse. What did Paul tell us? In the last days, you're going to see people forbidding marriage. He made them male and female, and he said it is good. Isaiah says, woe to those who call good evil and evil good. So because they say marriage is not good for priests, they go and they find a little altar boy or something like that. <laughs> That's why Paul says it's a doctrine of demons. You outlaw what's natural, people are going to do something on that. It doesn't work. This idea of cutting yourself off from the world to avoid worldliness is ridiculous. The only way to avoid worldliness is to live our lives in the power of the Spirit. Now one aspect of that is realizing the leaven that has to be continually cleaned out. This is a massive subject. So-called brothers. Now look what he says about them. This is quite a bit. An immoral person. I hate to sound like a broken record, but when you see people, two Christians, getting divorced and remarried with no biblical grounds, I don't mean a situation where somebody becomes a Christian after they were already married and their unsaved husband takes off with a woman or their unsaved wife leaves them. I'm not talking about that. I just mean two Christians who are married and decide they're incompatible and they get divorced and remarried. You realize, when I was first saved in the 1970s, that was unheard of. I didn't know anybody like that. I didn't know anybody who knew anybody like that. Now you've got preachers, tele-evangelists, who are divorced and remarried with no biblical basis, and they're in ministry. Every time those people take the Lord's Supper, they're eating and drinking judgment to himself, defiling his table. We should not take the Lord's Supper with them. The biblical grounds for divorce and remarriage in the New Testament for believers are very, very, very narrow. Very narrow. The last resort for believers when there's incompatibility or some other problem is separation with the door left open to the possibility of eventual reconciliation. But divorce with the right to remarry, the biblical grounds for that are at best very narrow. Very narrow. These people are living in adultery. Jesus made it clear. They're living, but we've been together 36 years and we have two children and we're so happy. We're blessed. You shouldn't judge us. I'm not judging. It's what Jesus said. It's adultery. Now, you've got an unbelieving partner who leaves you and goes off with somebody. That's completely different. 1 Corinthians 7 does make allowances for that to the best of my understanding. But that's it. The unbeliever leaves you, okay. But two Christians, this is, they're living immorally. Whoa. Covetous, idolater, a reviler, a drunkard, a swindler, covetous. The word faith money preachers are calling the sin of covetousness faith. They're calling the sin of covetousness faith. faith. Idolatry. 
Oh, I know born-again Catholics who love the Lord. Yes, and they kneel down before a statue of Mary with the rosary and engage in the sin of idolatry and necromancy. Now, I do not suggest that there are not true believers in the Roman Church, but if there are, the Holy Spirit will show them to get out of it. More so for liberal Protestant churches. Co-equally so for the Eastern Orthodox Church, I had never suggested that there are not people in those false religious systems who love Jesus, who due to ignorance and circumstances of birth and background are born into it, and they actually become believers while in it. That can happen. The Lord is in the business of saving people where they are despite their circumstances. But once they get saved and they have the Holy Spirit and they read the Scripture, the Lord is going to show them this is not right. Get out of it. Come out of her, my people. It doesn't say they're not his people. It says, because you are my people, get out of it. Lest you participate in her sins and share in her plagues. When you see people saying that you can stay in these false religions and continue to practice idolatry, what God calls idolatry. Hishtek in Hebrew, praskuto in Greek, genuflecting before a graven image. That's an act of idolatry by scriptural definition. We can't have fellowship with people like that. And by fellowship, I mean the Lord's Supper, when we break bread together as one body. Well, so it continues then. A swindler, <laughs> a reviler, drunkard. Well, we can talk about those things. I've got to be careful because I can get very angry at the money preachers. I've got to be careful to say what they're doing. I can call them <laughs> connivers and con artists because they are. But I've really got to be careful about my superlatives. <laughs> Jesus called them a generation of vipers and hypocrites, but he wasn't reviling. It's easy to begin reviling. How do you tell when you're reviling? When it becomes a self-righteous anger. The anger of man will never achieve the righteousness of God. When it becomes a self-righteous anger, then it's reviling. And, and the name calling, that's reviling. Uh, drunkard is another thing. I mean, look, my, my problem with alcohol, I, look, when I was a kid, I was strung out on cocaine and things like that. I didn't have any time for the minor vices. I was never a drunk. <laughs> my, my, problem, my problem with alcohol is putting a stumbling block in front of another believer who might have drank too much before they were saved. That's the issue for me. I don't care about the, I take it or leave it. As a beverage, it's one thing. As a drug, it's another. Non-medicinal use of alcohol as a drug is a sin. As, as a recreational, it's a sin. A beverage with meals, that's one thing. A wine makes the heart glad, that's one thing. But you've got to be careful about putting a stumbling block before a brother or sister who used it as a drug instead of as a beverage. And that was not my case, but I knew plenty of people who drank too much before they were Christians. I gotta watch it. Uh, but then we get into the swindler. I'm only stating facts, this is public. Aimed at Afro-Caribbean immigrant families in England, generally people of low income, the American money preacher, Morris Sorello, came to Great Britain, and one of his antics was, and he was targeting people of low of, of socioeconomic status who didn't have a lot of money. He was targeting them. And he was selling Holy Ghost miracle cloths, little squares of fabric, Holy Ghost miracle cloths to take away debt. He was selling them for 25 pounds, for like $40 to, to this is, this is 20 years ago. The poor families. Now, 40 bucks to them might be not having, not, that could mean there was no dinner that night. And he was aiming, aiming for the poor. Uh, this is a swindler. This is a swindler. So when Jesse Duplantis goes up to see Jesus in a cable car and Jesus sends him back down to get more money. These guys are swindlers. 
Oh, you're judging your brother. No, I'm not. God does. Not only that, but he who exploits the poor is a reproach to his maker. If you rip off a poor person, as far as God's concerned, you put your hand in God's pocket. God takes it personally. It's like you're ripping him off if you rip off poor people. Not that it's right to rip off anybody, but if you're ripping off poor people. We should have nothing to do with these people. Why? The leaven. Now, there are tendencies to these things within all of us. The tendency, just do your tax return. The IRS is crooked, the government is crooked, so they force honest citizens to behave like criminals when they don't want to. <laughs> crooked politicians force honest citizens to begin thinking like criminals when they don't want How do you render unto Caesar? It's, there's always... The rest of us have to battle this. The rest of us have to battle the leaven. But some people make it okay. They think it's okay to exploit the poor. They think it's okay to get divorced and remarried. They think it's okay to do these things. Thou shalt not covet. If cancer research knocks on the door and there's children selling chances on a car that Ford donated, well, I would buy the chance to support cancer research. The car was donated. I'm not coveting it. But to go to a racetrack or a casino, you're coveting somebody else's money. It's just the sin of covetousness. Christians should not be doing that. We should not be going to gambling. We shouldn't do these things. But I know Christians who go to... Now, I go to Las Vegas with my wife to see the Blue Man Group or go to the shows or something like that. But I'm not going to go bet in the casino. What? Something is wrong here. Once the leaven is accommodated... And then when we take the Lord's Supper, then it gets more serious. Well, let's begin at the beginning. Quite a word. Quite a word. Zumu. Zumu. It means to leaven something. To leaven something. Leaven contributes nothing to the nutritional value of bread. It just puffs it up. Bread is just there. It's when you leaven it. When you leaven it. And a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Leaven. Prozumio. To leaven. Zumu. Prozumio. Same root.
Hebrew, a little bit different. You write it from this side. <laughs> Hametz. Leaven as a verb or leavened. That which has been leavened. Hametz. To leaven something. Something might be all right until it is been leavened. Now we have another word just for leaven itself. Seor. Leaven as a noun. Hametz is basically a verb, adverb, something that's been leavened, or it's adjectival, it's been leavened. Say or is the noun, okay? But two different words in Hebrew. We are to beware of these things. We are to look out for these things. Now, the scripture essentially tells us there are certain kinds of leaven. The Old Testament books, the first word of each book of the Torah, of the Pentateuch, of the first five books of the Old Testament. The first word of the first verse is the name of the book, okay? Exodus, Shemot. In Hebrew, Exodus is the book of the names. The book of the names, those coming out of Egypt. Numbers, Be'midbar, in the wilderness. Okay. And we looked at Leviticus, Ve'yikra, and God called. When God calls, when we're in the wilderness sojourning, or when we're called out of Egypt, in each case, there is some kind of a prohibition dealing with leaven. Unless the leaven is dealt with, God can't help us. Unless the leaven is dealt with, God can't help us. Be very careful, as we've warned before, of seeker-friendly false gospels that do not speak of repentance. In The Purpose Driven Lie, Rick Warren says the following. He says, when you see a person involved in substance abuse or living immorally, don't tell them they have to repent. Just tell them they need Jesus in their life. Then he'll clean them up. He's confusing sanctification with justification. If they don't repent, he's not coming into their life. It is a formula for a false gospel. Or it is a false gospel. It is a formula for a false conversion, a false regeneration. If they don't repent, he isn't coming into their life. I was strung out on cocaine, shacking up with my girlfriend. You can't live that way anymore. you'll see how little, in fact, zero, emphasis on repentance there is in contemporary Christian <coughs> trends, particularly those attracting young people today. The Bill Johnson thing, the Hillsong thing, none of them talk about repentance. None of them. None of them. They're all seeker-sensitive. They're all seeker-friendly. Scripture is sin-hostile. Sin hostile. Jesus was hostile to sin. Loved sinners, but because he loved sinners, he was hostile to sin. No place do you see the gospel presented in the scripture the way it's being presented today in popular circles. No place. Repent and believe. Save yourself from this wicked and perverse generation. Now, we're not talking about the turn or burn stuff. That's preaching at people instead of to them. But the need for repentance is a central component of the gospel. 
Otherwise, it's not the true gospel. God will not do anything unless the issue of leaven is dealt with. So, we begin with the Pauline definition of leaven. Paul's definition. Sin deriving from the seminal sin Pride. Sin deriving from pride. That's Paul. That's the beginning. But then it begins to get really interesting. Look with me, please, to Matthew chapter 16, verses 5 to 12. And the disciples came to the other side of the sea, and they began to bring, they forgot to bring any bread. And Jesus said, watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they began to discuss this among themselves, saying, he said, beware, because we do not bring any bread. But Jesus, aware of this, said, you men of little faith, why do you discuss among yourselves that you have no bread? Do you not understand or remember the five loaves and the five thousand? Now, those five loaves correspond to the five books of the Torah. You understand? The law. The five loaves correspond to the five books of Moses. The Old and New Testament open with the Pentateuch. Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. Luke being the sequel, Acts being the sequel to Luke. Both Testaments open with the Pentateuch. Hence that or the seven loaves of the 4,000. And how many large baskets you picked up? Seven, again, the number of the church. We see this in various passages, certainly in Revelation chapters two and three. These are large baskets. He's emphatic about their size. How is it that you not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread but beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood he did not say to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the didache. So we have Jesus. He begins the leaven of the Pharisees, the leaven of the Sadducees. Let us continue. Mark chapter 8, verse 15, please. He was giving orders, watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. He repeats them again. And the leaven of Herod.
the Herodians. One, two, three. Let's go one more. Luke chapter 12. Beware the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. And the people all gathered together. He emphasizes the hypocritical nature, again, of the Pharisees. Notice he keeps repeating the Pharisees. The Herodians he names once, the Sadducees once, but the Pharisees are reiterated every time he says it. Now let's understand the reason. Compared to the Herodians, compared to the Sadducees, certainly compared to the Samaritans and the cult groups like the Essenes, compared to everyone else, the Pharisees were much closer to the truth in their doctrine. Compared to the others, they were the relative conservatives. <laughs> like nominal evangelicals. Compared to the others, they were much closer to the truth. That's why he keeps warning about them. The people who were faithful to God knew what was wrong with the Herodians. They were Roman collaborators. The people who were faithful to God knew that the high priesthood had become corrupt under the Sadducees. They knew the Sanhedrin was dominated by the Sadducees, and it was corrupt. People knew that. A lot of people knew it anyway. But people tended to think the Pharisees, both the school of Shammai and the school of Hillel, were the orthodox ones, were the good ones. He warns about them more than the others. And hence it comes into play. A little leaven leavens the entire lump. The most dangerous deceivers are not the obvious ones. The most dangerous deceivers are the ones who use significant amounts of truth to camouflage their error. The most dangerous deceivers are those who use significant amounts of truth to camouflage error. Jesus keeps warning about the Pharisees. The others he warns about, but not to the degree he warns about the Pharisees. They were taking in the most people. Now this gives us something to think about. He tells us in verse 1, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. It is hypocrisy. That word for hypocrisy in Greek is hupercrisis. Hupercrisis. It has two connotations. If it was Hupercrites, a similar word, hyperjudgmental. So we get the word hypocrite. <laughs> uh, Hupercrites, they're hyperjudgmental of other people. These people don't know the law, this kind of stuff. They were self righteous. But hupercrises is something else, related but different. Hupercrises is a feigned pretense of religiosity designed to deceive a feigned pretense of religiosity designed to deceive. Look at Matthew chapter 23, verse 28. 
So you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are filled with lawlessness. Ain't no more. They really don't have God's law. They replace God's law with a law of their own, as we'll see in a moment. They're like whitewashed tombs. They look nice, like a painted mausoleum, like a marble mausoleum, but inside are dead men's bones. That's what these people are. The leaven of the Pharisees always entails hypocrisy. There'll always be a feigned religious pretense to make people think that they are righteous. But now let's understand these three things. What is the leaven of the Pharisees, other than hypocrisy, of the Sadducees, and of the Herodians? The leaven of the Pharisees. Look with me, please, to understand this, to Deuteronomy chapter 4. In Hebrew, Deuteronomy is Dvarim. These are the things. Dvarim in Hebrew. Don't ask me why, but Luther's Bible, the German Bible, they call it Eina Moshe, Zwei Moshe, Drei Moshe, the first Moses, second Moses, third Moses. I don't know. How do they get that? Deuteronomy chapter 4. I was reading Luther's Bible in Israel a couple of weeks ago, and it was in German in you shall not add to the word of the to add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it. Do not add or take away. Solomon goes on to say in Proverbs, if you do that, you'll be proven a liar. The book of Revelation closes, the New Testament closes, and the canon of Scripture closes in Revelation 22 with a direct polemic and caveat by Jesus. Woe to those who add or who take away from the word of God. Woe to those who add or who take away from the word of God. Leaven will always have to do, will always involve, false teaching will always involve adding or taking away. Now, we're not talking about traditions or customs. We're talking about when you make traditions or customs canon. Leaven always has to do with either adding or taking away. Because when you do either, it blinds people to the truth of Christ. When you add to the word of God, you wind up replacing. We have a teaching called the devil's algebra on the internet where we explain it. We use a mathematical model to explain it. The devil's algebra. It blinds people towards the truth of Christ by adding. By taking away, it does the same thing. It blinds people to the truth of Christ. The Pharisees added. The leaven of the Pharisees added the oral law, the Torah be al pay. The leaven of the Pharisees added to the word of God the tradition of the elders. In the time of Jesus, it was all oral. It was not yet written. It was not written down until the second century by a rabbi called Yehuda Hanasi in Tiberias. But originally, it was oral in the time of Jesus, the oral law. The rabbis would then make the bogus claim, unsaved rabbis, would make the bogus claim that it was actually given to Moses on Mount Sinai, but he didn't write it. Now again, I do not wish to sound like anti-Catholic or anti-Jewish. My family are a mixture of Roman Catholic and Jewish. I love Jewish people and I love Catholic people. But what we call Judaism today is not Judaism. It is Rabbinism. Talmudic Judaism, Halakhic Judaism is Rabbinism. It was invented after 70 AD when the temple was destroyed 
initially by Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, a classmate of St. Paul's from the rabbinic school of Hillel. They were both disciples of Rabbi Gamaliel. I may have explained this here before in Columbus. It is rabbinism, real Judaism, Levitical Judaism with the sacrifices, Mosaic Judaism of Moses and the prophets has not existed since 70 A.D. It is not a Mosaic religion. It is a rabbinic religion. They read Moses through the prism of the rabbis. Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, and mainstream Protestantism are similar. They are not apostolic faiths. They are patristic. They read the apostles through the prism of the church fathers. Real Christianity is one thing. Most of what you see in mainstream Christianity is Christendom. Christendom. Liberal Protestantism, Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy are not scriptural Christianity. Neither is Talmudic or Halakhic Judaism scriptural Judaism. They are different religions that have hijacked the name. But their fundamental tenets are in conflict. How do they do this? With leaven. They either add to or take away. Now the claim of the rabbis that these things are actually shown to Moses, that's their justification, is immediately thrown out the window when you read Joshua chapter 8. Verse 35, there was not a word of all that Moses had commanded which Joshua did not read before all the assembly of Israel. Everything God told Moses was read, therefore it was written. Talmudic Judaism is a fraud. It is what Jeremiah predicted in Jeremiah chapter 2. Look with me very quickly to the second chapter of Jeremiah. Verse 13, my people, Israel, have committed two evils, two. They forsaken me the fountain of living waters. Remember John 7, I will give you living water at the pool of Shiloh, Siloam. The woman at the well, I'll give you living water. This he spoke of the Holy Spirit. My Mayim is a figure of the Holy Spirit living water. Jesus is the fountain of it. Remember in the Exodus, the rock that followed them where the water came was Christ. So the first sin was they would reject the Messiah, the one who'd give the Holy Spirit. Everybody see that? The second sin, they did this in order to who for themselves? Cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. They would invent a spiritually bankrupt false religion, the void of the Holy Spirit. They would invent a spiritually bankrupt false religion, the void of the Holy Spirit. This is rabbinism, falsely called Judaism. The only valid Judaism that exists today is Messianic Judaism, Jewish people who believe that Jesus is the Messiah and is born again and fulfilled the Torah. That's legitimate Judaism. That's the only legitimate Judaism. They still have a high priest. We still have a high priest. We still have a temple. We still have a sacrifice. Rabbinism does not. Islam is not submission to God. Islam should not be called Islam. It should be called Mohammedism. Mainstream Christianity should be called Christendom. Judaism should be called Rabbinism. It is non-Levitical to fulfill what Jeremiah said. Jesus saw this coming, and it would come from what the Pharisees did. Adding to the word of God. The mitzvah, the halakha, the gemara, all these things. 
the Pharisees. Their leaven was adding. If you listen to the devil's algebra, we explain Matthew 15. Teaching as precepts of God the inventions of men. Jesus told them that they were going to go to hell for doing that. He literally told them it was hell damning. Roman Catholicism cannot exist without doing what Jesus condemned the Pharisees to hell for doing. Read it. Find me mass cards. Find me purgatory. Find me rosaries. Find me Mary as co-mediatrix. Find me any of these things. It's not there. It can only exist by doing what Jesus said was hell damning. 1 Corinthians 4, 6 that you may learn from the apostles not to exceed the things which are written. You can believe things, but you can't believe them as doctrine. And you can't believe them if they contradict Scripture. You can't be dogmatic about anything not found exegetically included in the canon of Scripture. The Pharisees added, that was their leaven. They added. Okay. Now, it's easy to pick on the Church of Rome. Fast forward to the aftermath of the Reformation, John Calvin. Unlike Luther, who followed Erasmus, the Textus Receptus, which was four earlier Byzantine manuscripts, fused together into the Texas Receptus by Erasmus in, in the 16th century. And unlike William Tyndale, unlike Luther, John Calvin's Bible of choice was the Vulgate of Jerome, the Roman Catholic Latin Bible. Not a very good translation most of the time. And he continually said in his institutes, Calvin's interpretation of Christianity, or definition of it, by the authority of Augustine, by the authority of Augustine, by the... Augustine had no authority. Augustine said because God used violence to convert St. Paul when he knocked him off the horse, the church can use violence to convert people. After Constantine pseudo-Christianized the Roman Empire, Augustine said, the millennium is fulfilled now in the church. This is the millennium. If Satan is bound, I want to know who keeps letting him go. <laughs> By the authority of Augustine. The only thing that Calvin did was replace one unscriptural form of Christianity with another. <coughs> Roman Catholicism and Reformed Protestantism are both patristic. They're both Augustinian. This does not say, mean that Augustine did not say true things. He did when he refuted Pelagius and so forth. He was right, but he did a lot more harm than he did good. Adding. Lutheranism? Roman Catholicism? Reformed Protestantism? Eastern Orthodoxy? They all add... Look with me, please, to Matthew 13, 33. He's spoken of the parable, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all leavened. This is something bad, read in context, not something good. The wicked woman, the seductress, the seducer that you see in Revelation. She puts leaven in all three. The Eastern Church, the Greek one, the Byzantine, the Eastern Orthodox. Not very big in this country, but huge in Eastern Europe and the Middle East. The Western Church, Latin Church, Rome, and that which derives from it. And then Protestantism, all three are saturated with leaven. A little leaven leavens the entire lump of dough. It adds to. 
it adds to. Look with me, please, to Galatians chapter 5, verse 9. A little leaven that is the entire lump of dough. Now look what he says. <laughs> he says something very, very strong. Uh, in verse 11, I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? Then the stumbling block of the cross has been abolished. I wish that those who are troubling you would even mutilate themselves. The leaven of the Pharisees got into the early church trying to put believers, particularly non-Jews, under the law. I know of cases, of cases in South Africa where there are full-grown non-Jewish men, most of them Afrikaans, Dutch Africans, who are undergoing male circumcision in adulthood and going under the law to be observant. There's a phenomenon today better called synagogues. Non-Jews, or not people who are Jewish or married to Jews, but non-Jews going to messianic fellowships and becoming observant in a mandatory way. This is the oldest trick in the book. It's like the Seventh-day Adventists. Remember that guy David Kordish? in Waco, Texas. Every one of his followers was a Seventh-day Adventist. Once you get into one false doctrine, you're on a slippery slope, you'll believe anything. Trying to live under two covenants at the same time. Now my family are Israeli. We speak Hebrew at home. My children were born in Galilee because the mezuzah on the door. We always observe the Jewish holidays. Only Jesus is the Passover lamb. He's the light of the world at Hanukkah. No problem. That's cultural. That's a way to witness to unsaved Jews. But to put it on other people and say you have to observe these things? That is leaven. Look what Paul says. I'll tell you what it says in Greek. Those who are compelling non-Jews to be circumcised. Don't stop with the foreskin. Keep going until they're all singing soprano. <laughs> That's literally what it says. Let them mutilate themselves. Turn them into choir boys. That's what he's saying. That's actually what it says. The leaven of the Pharisees. I see it in the extreme access of the modern messianic movement, putting people under the law in a mandatory way. Again, I have no problem with Jewish believers and their families being observant. My own family is. But to put it on other people? In a legalistic way? The Amish are saturated with this. Their forebearers were believers. They were Mennonites. There were Anabaptists who were persecuted. Their forebearers had it right. But the leaven of the Pharisees, the traditions, just got them further and further away. German Baptist brethren are on the same road. Maybe they haven't gone quite as far, but it's the same. It's always the leaven of the Pharisees. They add to. He shaves. He's not in full form. There's something wrong with him spiritually. That is the leaven of the Pharisees. They don't keep the tradition of the elder. It's the leaven of the Pharisees. Seventh-day Adventism is built on it. Sadducees. They did the opposite. They were anti-supernaturalists, rationalists. They denied the angelic. They denied the resurrection. And they controlled the priesthood. Now let's talk about the Sadducees. Going back before the Hasmonean period, their forebearers, the Zadokites, the Sadducim, Sadokim, were the righteous clergy who did not become corrupted in the days of Ezekiel. 
in the time of the Babylonian captivity. The faithful clergy who did not get corrupted were the forebearers of the Sadducees, the sons of Zadok. Sadukim. Sadduk meaning righteous in Hebrew. We have a teaching on the internet called the sons of Zadok. But after the Hasmonean period, they became corrupted. It is amazing how the forebearers of a movement could have been so right, like Menno Simons, the founder of the Mennonites. And later generations are so far away from what their forebearers believed. Very few Methodists actually believe what John Wesley believed. John Wesley had it right. Today I know Methodists who don't believe anything except religion and the social gospel. He wasn't perfect, but the founder of the Salvation Army, Colonel Booth, he was a man of God. He had it right. He preached the gospel. Most of the Salvation Army today is liberal with the social gospel. World vision is the same. They begin right, but it doesn't take long. All you need is the leaven of the Pharisees or the leaven of the Sadducees. The Sadducees took away. We don't agree with this bit about the resurrection. We don't agree with this bit about the angelic. They simply omitted that which they disagreed with. They detracted. Always goes back to Deuteronomy 4. Dvarim. Always goes back to Revelation chapter 22. They either add or they take away. Well, what are they doing today? They're publishing inclusive Bibles. Censored Bibles. Gender inclusive. Romans 1 condemns homosexuality. We'll get rid of that bit. We'll take the things out of the Torah that says it's an abomination to sleep with a member of your own sex and so on. They're censoring the Word of God to justify what they're doing. Now by the time of Jesus, something happened. Because their forebearers were righteous before the Hasmonean era, these guys controlled the high priesthood. They were the mainstream clergy. In a sense, they were the equivalent of theological liberals. Their only strength was they denied the oral law held by the Pharisees. But then again, they denied the word of God itself. So what's the point? Yet they were the main ones. You look on TV today, you go on the History Channel, well, never is this documentary about the book of archaeology. 85% of the experts are unsaved professors in theology or archaeology who don't believe. <laughs> Supernaturalist rationalists who are not being fair with the evidence. The Sadducees. That was the state of Judaism in his first coming. That's the state of Christianity in his second. Then we have the Herodians. This was the big one, in a practical sense. Although Jesus emphasized the Pharisees more, in terms of the people who had the real power, it was the Herodians. The Sadducees collaborated with the Romans to a degree. They paid the Romans off and things like this. But the Herodians were Romans. They were Jews who were Romans. On the Temple Mount, towering over the fortress Antonio, were the pagan ensigns and eagles of Rome, higher than the house of God to its immediate south. The house of God was in the shadow of the fortress Antonio, up on the Temple Mount. We explain these things in depth in our book, Shadows of the Beast, how the Antichrist will be identified to the faithful church. The Roman general Pompey negotiated a treaty with the Jews. 
agreed to protect them from the Persians, the Parthians, Iran. <laughs> and he enters the Holy of Holies. Whenever you see someone other than the high priest on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, entering the Holy of Holies, it's a picture of the Antichrist. You understand? It's a picture of the abomination of desolations. Whenever you see Shekuts HaMesh men, whenever you see somebody other than the high priest on the Day of Atonement, who's a type, a shadow of Christ, entering the Holy of Holies, it is a picture of the Antichrist. Israel makes a treaty with Europe, with Rome, to protect it from Iran. What happens? Pompey enters the Holy of Holies in collaboration with the Jews who had the power. This is not just past history. It is future history. Now let's understand what Rome represented. Rome was a pontifical religion. The title of the emperor as head of the pantheon of Rome was the Pontificus Maximus, the bridge builder between all religions. Rome was absorbed, consumed by multiculturalism, to which they needed multi-faith accommodation of relations. They didn't care what religion you had as long as you acknowledged the pontiff as the bridge builder between them. It was a political agenda. Rome was multi-ethnic. It had Asians, it had Egyptians, it had Europeans, it had uh, Berbers, it had all kinds of people. Trying to hold them all together in a federal Europe. Daniel chapter 2 tells us the same thing will happen. They will desperately try to make the iron stick to the clay. They're doing it now. Despite the economic and political pressures after Brexit, Merkel and these people are desperately trying to make the iron stick to the clay. They will bail out Greece. They will do anything. Iron does not adhere to clay. These religions are, are an issue. I've said this before. Think of a map of Europe. You have somebody in Italy somebody in Ireland, somebody in Austria, and somebody in uh, Poland. What do they have in common? History? No. Cuisine? No. Culture? No. What's the only thing they have in common? Nomine Patre, Cum Filio, Cum Spiritus Santo. You got the cash, we got the absolution. Amen. <laughs> Adeum quile tificat juventut en meum. Sucipia domino sacrificium de manibus tui. At larum et glorium nobilis sui. Ad utilitatem quoque nostrum totiusque ecclesiae sui sante, says the pontiff. Now the pontiff is the pope, isn't he? Don't meet in Assisi, Italy with Zoroastrian priests with Muslim imams, the Jewish rabbis, he just wants to be the pontiff. Multi-faith, multicultural, multi-religious unity with a political agenda to make the iron stick to the clay. These were the Herodians. Rome had religio licita. We'll give anybody a license for any religion. The Jews made a deal. We can't sacrifice to the emperor once they deified him. So therefore we'll sacrifice for him and they got the license. Originally the believers were protected by the license of the synagogue because they were a sect within Judaism. Once they were excommunicated from Judaism for believing in Jesus, they no longer had a license. That's why the church was persecuted, but the Romans let the other religions alone. Then they turned against the Jews. The Antichrist will do the same. With Nero, they went against the Christians particularly, and then a few years later, they went against the Jews. The Antichrist will do the same. 
will go against the Christians, then will turn against the Jews. That is going to happen again. In order to understand what is going to happen, we need to understand what did happen. But how did it happen? The leaven of the Herodians. Now, as we've explained in my book, Shadows of the Beast, Herod the Great and all of the Herodians are types, pictures of the Antichrist. Herod was an Idumean. He was an ethnic Arab. But he converted, his parents had converted to Judaism. He was religiously a Jew by way of political convenience. He actually expanded the temple using Ezekiel's vision of the millennial temple combined with Greco-Roman architecture. That was the temple of Herod. Again, these things foreshadow what the Antichrist will do with the temple. Then, in addition to being an Arab and a Jew, the Romans considered him to be a Roman. He's our guy. He's one of us. The Europeans regarded him as European, the Arabs Arab, and the Jews Jew. This teaches something about the Antichrist and how he's going to bring a false beast to the Middle East. I would point you to my book, Shadows of the Beast. But it was the fortress Antonio overshadowing the temple. Remember the temple's divided? What do you see in Revelation 11? The outer court is given to the Gentiles, isn't it? A false peace in the Middle East, all these religions together, there it is on the Temple Mount, the abomination of desolation. In 70 AD, when the temple was destroyed, the Romans began worshiping the pagan gods and ensigns on the Temple Mount. Unbelievable. To know the future, know the past. If you don't know the history, you won't know the future because the history is the future history. It is all recapitulated. The leaven of the Herodians. You can have any religion you want, as long as you play the right political game of multiculturalism and interfaith relations. Why do you think President Trump stopped off in Rome? First he goes to the Arabs, then he goes to the Jews, then he goes to Rome, to the Pontic. <coughs> Am I saying Trump is the Antichrist? Of course not. But it's that spirit, you understand? In other words, ecumenism. into faith. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. They're hypocrites, Jesus said. They know how to camouflage their true agenda better than anybody else. Because so much of what they say is right. <coughs> Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They take away from the word of God. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Herodians. They have an interfaith agenda. This is quite a thing. This is quite a It is very important that we understand the leaven of the Pharisees and the cloak of religious hypocrisy that veils it. It is a feigned religiosity. Beware of the leaven of the Sadducees. Take away the bits you don't like. Get a censored Bible. Some of these paraphrases are ridiculous. If you got a copy of the message by Eugene Peterson, put a match to it. God will bless you. <laughs> Rick Warren's Bible of Choice. Now, what's Rick Warren's agenda? Look on his website. His global peace plan. I said this many times. 
Moses said other gods are devils. Shadim. Paul says other gods are devils. Demonoi. Rick Warren says we have to unite with Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims to bring in global peace. This is the agenda of the Antichrist. We unite with people who worship demons to bring in global peace. It'll be a false peace. This is the leaven of the Herodians. That's why he's a member of the Council of Foreign Relations. Pharisees, Sadducees, Herodians. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but he is. Pharisees, Sadducees, Herodians. Eleven, eleven. Now Jesus didn't just say beware. Look how he phrased it. He said, watch and beware. There's a difference between watching and beware. Beware is when it shows up, you know it's wrong. When you're watching for it, you know it's coming. <laughs> he didn't just say beware. He said watch and beware. Be a watchman. He didn't just say recognize it when you see it. Don't let it in your church or in your mind or in your family. He said watch for it. It's coming. Know what it is before it gets to your church. Before it gets to the door. Know it's coming. And in the last days it comes like a torrential storm. The leaven, the Pharisees, Sadducees, and Herodians. Well, the problem is it's already gotten in the door. You've got major evangelicals like Tony Campola and that Hillsong guy caving in on homosexuality as a moral issue. That's the leaven of the Sadducees. We certainly have the leaven of the Pharisees. There are Protestant denominations that are in part built on it, particularly the Calvinistic ones. The leaven of the Herodians? <laughs> the political agenda. You look at it. Oh, forget about the fact that somebody's divorced and remarried. We agree with him politically, so he's <laughs> all right. They redefine morality based on somebody's political positions without reference to personal morality. The Republicans do this, the Democrats do this. You've got guys like Jesse Jackson with no biblical right to be in ministry because of his womanizing, having a child out of wedlock and taking money that was donated to the Rainbow Coalition to help inner city youth and he paid this woman an exorbitant salary to keep her quiet about his love child. Now, if he really repented, he wouldn't be in the ministry. He doesn't meet the qualification. Doesn't matter, we agree with him politically. He's a good brother. Republicans do the same thing. Doesn't matter party. The world is in the power of the wicked one. Also in the power of the world. Donald Trump's on his fourth marriage. <laughs> Again, I, I'm not speaking politically and saying who to vote for and who not to. I'm simply saying the world is in the power of the wicked one. We have to see these things as God sees them. Do I pray for President Trump every day? Do I trust any politician? No. I realize what's going on. Why did he go to Saudi Arabia and then to Israel and then to Rome? Notice he didn't move the embassy or anything, as he promised. <laughs> Still taking our money and giving it to the Palestinian Authority who are rewarding terrorists, families of suicide bombs. It's business politics. Saudi Arabia beheads Christians. Did he say a word about it? No! It's all corrupt and phony. But you see, the leaven of the Pharisees makes people think he's our guy. He's a Christian, you know, Christian. <laughs> because he seems more like one of us, it, that covers it. No, it doesn't. That's the leaven that Jesus wanted to beware of the most. The leaven of the Sadducees, it's more obvious. Same-sex marriage. The leaven of the Herodians, the ecumenical agenda. 
Beware, beware, beware. Okay, we need to. Remember, these things have to do with the future, not just the past. If you don't know the past, you won't know the future. Biblical history is future history. We don't understand it simply to know what happened. We understand it to know what's going to happen. Understand? The issue is not to study it to find out what happened, primarily. That's a secondary feature. We study it to find out what is going to happen. If you don't know where you came from, you won't know where you're going. <laughs> if you don't know the past, you're never going to know the future until it's too late. We're supposed to know the future. Beware, beware, beware. Well, it's important to beware of those things. And it's easy to talk about beware of those things. But problematic as these things are, as distressful and as complicated and sometimes disheartening as these things are, that Christians don't understand this by and large. I always go back to the Pauline leaven. That's the one that causes me the most problem. This other stuff causes me a problem, but they're not my biggest problem. My biggest problem are not the Pharisees, the Sadducees, or the Herodians. My biggest problem is my old nature. A little leaven leavens the entire lump. Clean out the old leaven so you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ our Passover has been crucified. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. The leaven of the Pharisees is a huge problem. The leaven of the Sadducees is a huge problem. The leaven of the Herodians is a huge problem. But the leaven of my old nature is a bigger problem than all those things put together. That's my problem. That's your problem. On Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry, as Christians call Palm Sunday, when Jesus drove the money changers out of the temple, he was performing the Bedichat Hametz. He was cleansing the leaven out. You understand? He was cleansing out the leaven out of his father's house so the Passover could be celebrated. We've got to clean out that leaven. Yes, we've got to watch out for these things. We've got to watch out for the leaven of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Herodians. We've got to not just beware, but watch out for it. And it's not an exhortation or an admonishment. It's a command. Watch out! It's coming. Watch out. It'll be in. Watch out. But that first one? <laughs> yeah. I can fight to get the leaven out of the church. But I got to fight to get the leaven out of me. The leaven of the Pharisees. The leaven of the Sadducees. The leaven of the Herodians and the leaven of Jacob Prash, the old man, the old woman. That's my problem, and that's your problem, too. Beware of the leaven. God bless. Let's have a break. <laughs>